Hello, I am Samantha Simpson, and this is The Movement. And today I'm excited to speak with Juliana Yassa, and she runs a church in South Florida called Amazon Roots. Can you tell us a little bit more about your church? First, I want to say that uh, we're going to be talking about uh, plant medicine today. So it, it this is a hot topic. A lot of people hear about people going away on ayahuasca retreats and such. And Juliana uh, lives it and works it with uh, her church. Can you share with us a little bit more about that? Yes. Yeah, so our church, Amazon Roots, um, I founded about like eight years ago, um, really for the protection, the, the religious freedom that gives us the opportunity to work with indigenous cultures. So really, our belief system is revolved around connection with Mother Earth. So yes, one of our main sacraments is ayahuasca, but we, um, Amazon Roots is the umbrella for uh, a church that is really two branches so it's ayahuasca and peyote and um this really is like deep symbolism from the past and the the visions that all people had in these times that we're living the time of prophecy and one of the prophecies that we are really big on in this church is called the eagle and the condor prophecy so what that means is when the eagle the tribes of the north which is the eagle and the tribes of the south the condor start are working together and bringing their medicines together it's the time of like the rainbow children and the reawakening of the people of mother earth so we work with two plant sacraments and both of them are very important to the healing because ayahuasca by herself she's a great medicine and teaches people like a lot of internal processes but the peyote without the peyote it's like the peyote is like the mind and the peyote really teaches people how to focus and how to like direct their energy, direct their prayer. It's like an arrow, you know, and the ayahuasca is the heart, you know, and it's like you need these two to be in alignment to be able to open up that vision, open up the connection to your heart. So each one is very important, but it did start as an ayahuasca church. And then mm -hmm. I met my husband and he's a peyote roadman. So oh. together now we are, I'm Amazon roots. So like he works with me as well. And his church is called Teokali Quetzalcoatl. So we're really um, the Amazon roots family. And you can find us on Instagram, Amazon roots family. And really it's these two components, which is also uh, the masculine and the feminine. You know, because ayahuasca, we call her grandmother and peyote is grandfather. So there's a lot that goes into these two components in these times. So um, really, our belief system is based upon the reawakening of humanity at, you know, at with these medicines, with these sacred sacraments. I want to talk a little bit about both of these uh, sacred medicines for people who have maybe never even heard of them before, or maybe you've just heard a little bit about them. And I have experience with both of them and they're, they feel so different for me. And I know that the tradition and history of the ayahuasca is from South America, whereas the peyote is more uh, Mexico and Southwest uh, America. So in the United States, and it does feel like a, uh, um, they they have been gendered so the the aya is the mother and the the peyote is the father and it feels like um like ooh they've just don't totally have different vibes and uh it, i feel like in an ayahuasca ceremony you kind of go inward mm -hmm. and you are seeing things um the ones I've experienced, and I don't know if this is how you do it, but the ayahuasca ceremonies, we lay down on a mat and close our eyes. Whereas in the peyote ceremony, we are asked to sit up for the whole ceremony uh, and be present and awake. Is that how yeah. you things? So, yes, you got the gist of it. I mean, it gets to a point with the ayahuasca that eventually, like if you if, if this is your path and you feel like, okay, 
I'm meant to work with this medicine. At some point, we're going to ask you to like sit up, you know, as well, pay attention to the ceremony. But especially for those people that are coming for the first time, laying down and closing your eyes is very common. And that's because you never know which body the ayahuasca is going to work on. And we have four. So we have the mind, body, the mental body, the physical body, the emotional body, and the spiritual body. And, you know, a lot of times in people's first, second, third ceremony, she manifests a lot in the physical body and the mental body. And sometimes the mental body and the physical as well, it's like a bit paralyzing. Like you'll be like, you won't be able to like, get out of your head you know if people have a deep spiritual practice and come to ayahuasca without a lot of mental heavy loads they can access the spiritual realms pretty easily but that's not the case for a lot of people a lot of people it takes them like two three four ceremonies to like remove that mental load that they really carry around day to day so um a lot of people do lay down and and that it's totally fine with the protocol of ayahuasca generally speaking from the amazon where it comes from we do have participants lay down and close their eyes and a lot of times when you close your eyes you get to go to various locations whether that's like in the spiritual realm in the blueprint of the earth um past lives could be anything because the spiritual realm is like so huge so in your current life i know of a woman who uh took some uh went to several ayahuasca ceremonies and remembered uh traumatic events from childhood and adolescence that she had blocked like things you would think that nobody could forget they were so traumatic but she remembered under the medicine would that be what you would call like a, a mental? The medicine was affecting her mentally? No. If it's an, a memory, it's emotional. Okay. Because okay. it's and like when you mean? get to reconnect your brain and your experiences, like, you know, how it creates new pathways mm -hmm. in the mind, that's emotional. Okay. So it's not okay. mental. And how would we know if we were having a physical experience on uh, on ayahuasca? You would feel, you could feel headache, you could feel nauseous, you could, you know, you have to use the bathroom. It could manifest like a knee pain, back pain, neck pain. And those are all like your unconscious mind, like giving you signs like, okay, I have a headache. Okay, I have a neck pain. I have back pain, knee pain. And they all represent something. I'm, I'm not the one, I don't know off the top of my head, like, okay, knee pain represents this, but each person, according to their blueprint, will have to do like a discovery of, they have to like look for it. So fascinating. And, and, um, I, that's so many questions for you. This is a, this is really fascinating to me. How would you feel, how would you, uh, describe the peyote ceremony being different? completely different i like to look at them like the yin and the yang like polar and um like the north and the south pole like one is revolves around like it's lunar ayahuasca is like really lunar dark yin feminine and the peyote is like the sun it's masculine it's like focus energy everything in the peyote ceremony means something you know, the way that you walk, the way that you sit, the way that you sing, all the instruments, um, the way that we pray, all the positions, they all all mean something, especially um, speaking in the Native American church. Like there's many tribes, you know, like the Navajo, Diné, the Lakota, Dakota, and they all have like different representations of like, okay, what the drum means, what the rattle means, certain songs, but everything is like meaningful. And we ask participants to like really sit up and be a part of the ceremony. And a lot of times for the first timers, it's a struggle to sit up, to like really be there. It's hard. You'll be like, oh, this is so hard. I'm so tired. But that's like the battle that you have to beat. You're, that's the mind battle. 
in the mm-hmm. peyote. It's the oh. mental battle. And then a lot of things come up like repressed anger, repressed emotions, and you process them like really up until like the third tobacco, like the sponsored tobacco. Like a lot of people have a hard time and that's like their mental body as well. It's like a little bit like ayahuasca, but it's not because it's, it's like grandpa, like tougher. It's like tough love, you know, like a lot of times with the ayahuasca, it's like a little bit more soft, like that mental load, not always. It's just, it's, it's hard to compare the two, you know, and how, Mm -hmm how they like get across in your mind and the peyote in that sense teaches you that's where you learn how to like okay well this is just my mind that's where you learn really to like put your mind aside more right. than ayahuasca I hear you there with the tough love i have been in um at least half a dozen peyote ceremonies and our our teacher, our shaman, the the road man that that I've worked with, he is he's pretty tough on us. He'll he'll <laughs> get upset. He'll sometimes yell at us. And if somebody's lying down, like he'll make us all stand up um, and pay attention. It's very important, but it's it's something that you will remember. He's like you can't you can't uh, get this uh, these spiritual teachings uh, while you're sleeping. Um, and it, it is painful. I want to speak on that. Um, once on when I was uh, taking the medicine, taking the sacrament, um, I had a revelation that um, when I was sitting up and my heart was full and open and I was in that good kneeling position, I felt that I could I had more pure thoughts and communications with my prayer to God than I did, uh, even if my head was just drooping. And then if my heart was drooping and like I was holding myself up on my elbows, then those bad thoughts would come and the pain would increase. And if I, the first time I did a ceremony, I totally laid down, just completely collapsed. And the pain was the most supreme that way. And I, what I, what this taught me was I teach posture for a living. And it, and what it taught me was this, this, the sacredness of the posture, especially in prayer in these meetings that, that, uh, when we're present in our lives, we can, we can be present with God and, uh, and all the good things. And when we succumb to the bad thoughts and just like the, just falling out of the posture, that's when, you know, the, the pain and the painful thoughts come. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I actually totally agree. And, um, I feel like, Definitely your posture plays a big role into um, receiving energy. And, um, you know, like you said, when you sit on your knees, like the way that you're supposed to sit in a peyote ceremony, you're more open to receive blessings from the ancestors or the guides that show up. You're more open, you're more aware. And as well as like giving reverence to the elements, it makes you like more open to receive the blessings that they have to offer. And it takes, it takes work to really understand that, you know, it's like your first or second ceremony. It's a little bit like hard to comprehend what we mean by it, but especially, you know, there's four main moments in NAC native American church peyote ceremonies there's the four main tobaccos and especially those two that are for the water um a lot of people they don't in their day-to-day lives think of what having water means but like a lot of people in the world more than a million more than one billion people in the world don't have access to clean water so when we're sitting in a peyote meeting and we have the ability to pray for that water to reach other people it's it, it it's like it's such an honor you know and and it's hard for people to like relate to that so we try really hard being that we are in south florida you know like maybe like party capital of the united states we try really hard to like work with people on a on a level that they can understand because it's not that 
easy you know like my partner sometimes used to like he he does have to yell at people like you said with your road men because we take this very seriously and before the 1960s people sacrificed their lives there, you know many people have died saving these traditions so it's like we want to keep these traditions alive so it's like we are not serving people we are serving the medicine so we try to explain and be very patient with people especially in those aspects the water the sacreds you know these things are sacred for a reason let's put our energy let's put our prayers that's why we sit up that's why we pay attention as well to receive the blessings but if people you know if they don't want to get it if they're not able to like put their egos aside it, you know it, it might not be for them you know, um, especially peyote. Ayahuasca is a bit more, we're a bit more lenient in, you know, how people behave in the ceremony, but peyote is like, we're strict, you know, and it's because this is very meaningful to us as well as all the moments in the ceremony. They're there and we say peyote tension, like peyote, peyote tension. Love that. So, yeah. <laughs> Do you, uh, couple questions do you find more people attracted to ayahuasca or peyote ceremonies and second question is um where did you learn uh about the ayahuasca ceremonies you say that's that's what you studied and uh your husband was a roadman i'd like to hear a little bit about his his history as well so um you asked first was um what people are more attracted to it's actually uh pretty even um, well, since I started with the ayahuasca, like more people that knew me associated me with that. But now that we've been together for like six years, um, different types of people are called to both. Some people do like both. And, and when they when people are able to do both, it's like it gives a certain understanding different than people that just like one or the other. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, when I was, when I graduated high school, I was 18, I'm 30 now. Mm -hmm. I was 18. I started my psychedelic awakening in high school. I used to love um, mushrooms and like, you know, I used to have a lot of fun just with psychedelics. So when I, and I'm Brazilian, so I used to like read about like different plant medicines, just, just as a hobby, like for fun when I was you know, 14, 15. And um, I read about ayahuasca and being Brazilian. I was like, I, I really wanted to find it in Brazil. And I wasn't, I wasn't able to find it in Brazil. Like I looked and I was like, nope, I, I just wasn't ready for it. Then when I finally graduated high school, um, I heard of some people doing like Colombian ceremonies in Miami uh so that was about 12 years ago and um i went to the ceremony it was a woman and um uh, at that ceremony right away the medicine basically told me like your life is is dedicated to this from now on like i hope you had a lot of fun but like um basically it it went through like my past life um was 500 years ago and um, I was a native, I was a man, I was an Inca. It was like, it was like kind of mind boggling. I didn't understand it fully. I was like, what? I tried to like ask the medicine lady for, you know, for help or guidance. And people just laugh it off because, um, you know, a lot of times, a lot of people, you know, do say like, oh, I want to do this. I want to serve the medicine. And, and since I was one of those people, I try not to, like, if someone comes up to me and says, hey, I'm supposed to do this, I try to take them as seriously as I can and guide them, but it's only the medicine. Gonna, mm -hmm. if, if, if the medicine wants somebody to serve the medicine, they will. They will. Mm -hmm. she, she took my hand and basically, like she said, my life was over. I started just working with Colombian Yahe. Um, for like two years. Um, and then That's when Colombian I finally, Yahe. Colombian Yahe is, it's, um, there's many different tribes in Colombia, like from Putumayo and different places. I never went to Colombia. I was working in Miami with a few Colombians 
And, um, but, but two years only. And then when I finally tried Brazilian medicine, which was my ex partner, he's from a tribe called the Huni Queen tribe. He came to Miami. I met him. I ended up being his translator because I'm Brazilian. He spoke Portuguese. And it was like, I was like, wow, I'm never drinking Colombian Yahe again. I'm like, this is it. This is the one, you know? So then I was his translator and his uh, assistant for about like six years. And then, you know, we, we really got to learn a lot together because he was coming from another culture. He didn't really know how to work with white people. And uh, I really, you know, was new at the medicine, which was his life. So like both of us, we joined forces and we went around the world. We went around the world. I spent many years with his family. I'm still in touch with them, you know, absolutely still consider them my family, my tribe. And um, at the end of our six years, you know, it was it was just very hard relationship wise. Like it's like you know, being interracial, intercontinental, like we couldn't make it work. But basically they initiated me as a medicine carrier from their family. I'm, it's like the Huni Queen tribe is one of the biggest tribes in the world to this day. There's like now 16,000 people in the Huni Queen tribe. I was initiated by a specific family in the Huni Queen tribe. Um, their name, they're the Saboyas. And um, they're from a specific place. So it's like, I have a specific lineage from the Huni Queen tribe since they're so big. And Huni Queen is just like Navajo is the government given name. The Huni Queen okay. government given name is Kashinawa. Okay. And they only made contact with white people um, in, in the 1960s. Wow. It's so a it's what you get to... Uh... They've chosen you to serve their medicine. Do you get the medicine from them? Um, right now, it's a bit complicated. I used to, or like I have to fly in and pick it up. But right now, actually, everything just is sourced from within the United States. Okay. Okay. Um, and and your husband? He's my a my husband is a is a peyote roadman from the oh. Teocali Quetzalcoatl lineage, which comes from. Texas, but it's like Texas Mexican. Can you tell people what a what a peyote roadman is? It's um, you know, instead of the word shaman, uh basically we call people that travel and serve the peyote medicine, we call them roadmen. Or there's also nowadays road women, which is you know not as common as road men, but it's a new thing now. Awesome. Maybe one day I'll be a road woman oh, when my cool. kids grow up. Does he travel a lot? Um, at this point, not really because of the children. Like, it's hard for me without him. But he does. He went to, like, Kansas and New York recently. But, you know, our youngest baby six months. And then we have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. So it's, like, it's just tough for us right now. With the children, they all need us. Mm -hmm. How often so, do you how often do you host ceremonies uh, at uh, where you're at in Florida? Oh, we do them like once, twice a month. We also do like sweat lodges. Like I have a community chat that I'm most active in. I have an email group. I don't always get to send out emails. My community chat is like the one where I um, am constantly talking to the community. I post videos and, and voice notes. Um, the email list, that's also like how I communicate things, even though I haven't really been that active with the email list. Um, but we do things very often. It sound, I looked at uh, your uh, Instagram and it, I see you have uh, Chinupa ceremonies, sweat lodges, uh, rape ceremonies, moon ceremonies, and sound baths. It sounds like heaven to me. Uh, you're serving a a community um is your community uh large i noticed you have ten thousand followers on instagram are those people who are local to you or no um like i said when i was with my partner that taught me um 
we traveled like around the world. So I think a lot of those followers come from different uh, communities. But now it's been like six years that I'm fully like based in Florida. The one place we do travel too often is North Carolina, maybe like once or twice a year. And we do a ceremony there called Eagle Condor. Um, a lot of times my uncle comes from the Amazon, one of my teachers from the family lineage that I was telling you, the Saboyas. Um, my uncle, Chanamasha, comes from the Amazon. He leads the ayahuasca and I help him. And my husband leads the peyote. So two nights we do that. We want to do it like once or twice a year in North Carolina. Awesome. Oh, we know a road man in North Carolina too. Do you know the Little Braves? Yep, yep. I mean, I don't personally know them. Um, just a lot of our friends know them and talk about them to us so I feel like I know them <laughs> how many people would come to a typical ceremony that you host in Florida um it really depends like a lot of times if I'm doing one let, let's say I bring my uncle from from Brazil I don't close it I so it could be even up to like 60 people oh wow um, if it's just me and a lot of times I do them at home, then I close it at 20 people. If it's okay. not at home and we're like renting our location, it's a bit bigger. Um, I, I, depending on the size of my team, I feel confident enough with like 30 to 40 people. If I have a really good team, I could do 50 people. If it's my uncle and me leading the ceremony, I feel confident even up to like 70 people. Who would you recommend do one of these ceremonies? And would you recommend one ceremony for this type of person and this ceremony for this type of person? How does that yes. work? So men, men, I really, really recommend them to try peyote. Mm -hmm. um, it just helps with the masculine energy in all ways. Like it helps people man up. You know, like, yeah. and, and that's a problem that we're having in the United States. Uh, who knows what's in the water supply or, you know, what they're giving us in our food. But peyote will help you man up. And that's something that <laughs> needs to happen, you know. The people I've invited to meetings have completely changed and become stronger, um, mm -hmm. more resilient men because exactly. of this medicine. Yeah, exactly. And women are just naturally stronger. So um, if they feel called to come to a peyote ceremony, that's great. You know, like women, you know, even in the sweat lodges, even in the teepee, you see women have like an easier time sitting up and paying attention than men. Like, I don't know where their mind goes, but I honestly think that peyote is a little bit better for men. Um, it used to be that it was an only men ceremony back in the days because women, yeah, because women would be the children of the home of the food and men are the one that really need to like come together and pray and focus. Um, it's helpful for everybody. You know, I, I recommend the medicine for everybody. It's not easy. Um, I do like people to know that before they come in. Um, we don't, we're not like catering to you. We're, we don't see people as like clients or this. No, it's like, we take care of the medicine. We want you to also understand the sacredness and the value of the medicine. We're not like here to baby anyone, especially with peyote. With ayahuasca, you know, I'm a mama of three. I do take care of people differently. And ayahuasca can make people access like deep traumas and, and emotional things processes that they weren't able to let go of or like you know put together in their minds so I do take care of people a little bit more soft and gentle you know if someone really has like a deep um emotional wound or something going on I I do think ayahuasca is is good for them and might be better for people that know nothing about plant medicine with me I mean the way that I work with ayahuasca because like there's many types of of ayahuasca work it's not like peyote it's like there's many ways that you could cook the ayahuasca there's many the tribes sing different songs um there's many ways that you could run a ceremony it's like so diverse not really like peyote is there anyone you would recommend to not do these ceremonies um anyone that's you know schizophrenic um for ayahuasca especially peyote might be a little bit more you know, 
easy for them to start to level out, you know, their imbalances. Ayahuasca, you just, if you're taking any medication for depression or anxiety, um, you have to be off of it for like at least a week. And there's, there's specific diets that, uh, that I know that I was asked to follow before taking ayahuasca but not uh not peyote i was never giving any information about any, no. any diet there's no diet really with peyote um be be careful with the med medications you know mm -hmm. of course but um with ayahuasca yes you you need to be very careful and and watch over your diet you know no meat um, like three days before some people take it a little bit more serious, like the Peruvians and the Colombians. So to do the diet for like three weeks for us, you know, just the week of the ceremony, our brew is not like so he uh, heavy on the stomach. So it's mm -hmm. like, you don't have to be worried about like, Oh, I'm going to throw this up or that up with some of the ayahuasca's you do need to listen to the person that's providing the ceremony so it really depends with us our diet is just like no alcohol no drugs um antihistamines um even certain things are okay pain medication it's fine but the cleaner that you can be the better okay i want to talk a little bit about getting well which is kind of plant medicine uh a verbiage for getting sick what we would call puking or throwing up in a ayahuasca ceremony, it was encouraged to me to purge, mm -hmm. um, very much encouraged. I was told that like, that's how I will let go of the shit. However, in the peyote ceremony, our roadman would tell us we were wasting the medicine if we were getting well, and <laughs> he, he would encourage us to keep it down. And he said that yeah. if we had a cart, it would taste like strawberries. <laughs> so yeah like I said polar opposite they really are um of course you know you should try to keep the medicine down as much as you can for both but with ayahuasca you know if something comes up yeah definitely release it because it's like you can be releasing and we call it getting well just like you said getting well it's like you're releasing something that you don't need anymore you know something it could be emotional it could be mental it could be physical you don't know what it is but it 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 did its service to you um it helped you out and you know or brought you down but it's finally time to like move on so that's why we say getting well we, we don't need this anymore we are it's well wellness it's we're done with it you know what kind of problems have you seen uh this these medicines help heal in people i've seen you know so there's something about like this false light wall you, you nothing is a heal all you if the medicine tells you something it's really up to you to do the work but what i see um common ground is helping people to think more positive in general um you know see more of a synchronistic way of seeing life like connectivity people start to understand okay we all are one and that's something that we lack in in humanity it's like it's like we're seeing our brothers and sisters and we feel no remorse we feel no humanity oh they deserve this nobody nobody we're all one if they deserve that we deserve it so it's like connectivity is the number one thing that i believe that these medicines start to awaken in people the humanity that has been lost for so many years and but it's up to the person, you know, it's like some people come and and it's they have such heavy programming, heavy mental loads that a lot of times they're not able to get past that. But, you know, common ground is a lot of people do. A lot of people do get past it. A lot of people do their homework. The medicine tells them you need to do this. And if they do it, they will see a change in their life. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Um, I know that I've had, wow, some profound shifts in my own life uh, with, with both medicines and worked in very different ways. Uh, one, 
just, I didn't even realize the healing that it did until about a year later. Um, cause, uh, I had what, uh, what I thought was like a, a bad one, uh, um, a bad medicine and it left me shaken for a few weeks afterwards. Um, I talked to the, the medicine man and he was like, uh, you know, look for, look for something good out of it. And I was like, no, it was no good. It was all bad. Um, uh, I went with a, uh, with uh, somebody I knew and she asked the medicine. She told us ahead of time, she wanted to see what happened to her when she was a child. Um, and I was positioned right next to her. And as soon as I took the medicine, um, I started seeing what happened to me as a child and I'm like, oh no. And then for eight hours, like I was I was seeing this video of, you know, the worst part of my life that I could remember. And I was like, this isn't what I asked for. Um, and I was really bitter about that for a long time. But I, I made a realization that night that changed my entire life for the next year. And I didn't realize it until a year later. And um, I, I won't get into this story now because it's pretty deep and personal, but I ended up a uh, reaching out to the medicine man and be like, you know what, you're right. Um, and he said, that's what I said. Medicine always does good. So even, I guess my point is, even if you, if you don't understand at the moment what it's doing, um, maybe you'll have a revelation later on. Yeah. So like, remember circling back to my first vision that I said that um, I took the medicine. I was 18. I really didn't know what they were saying. Like, cause it sounded like some, some, something was shouting at me. Like, like you waited 500 years to reincarnate. And I was really lost. I was like, what? Like I waited 500 years. Um, the medicine is now going to take over my life. It was really confusing. And I was like looking for guidance um, around it, but nobody, not if I'm serving you the medicine, I don't know what the medicine is telling you, you know, that's up to you to figure it out. And sometimes it's like a web, you have to circle back, circle back, circle back. And you'll keep going back to that ceremony until you finally dissect what it was trying to tell you. And it might be tough. It might be hard, but when you finally like receive that pearl of wisdom that the medicine had in front of you, even if it seemed like darkness, when it finally opens the door to like clarity, you're like, wow, that was like, that was really deep. You didn't even understand how deep it was. Sometimes it takes us, it could go even up to like 10 years. You're like still circling back, circling back, circling back. And it has more and more to offer you just from that one ceremony five years ago, 10 years ago, you know, so it's, it's, it, it doesn't work like in, in linear time. It's like you wow. keep coming in waves and it's like, once you have the medicine in you, even if it's just once you always have the medicines with you, they are, they are spirits, you know, so calling upon those energies and, and, and using like connection, like, okay, I want to connect with the, the plant spirit um, to to kind of guide me on what it was trying to tell me, you know, because nobody else knows your soul. Like she comes in and reads and scans. And I'm talking about, you know, ayahuasca at this point comes in, reads and scans and um, is going to give you something, um, you know, if she opens her doors or not, sometimes she decides like, nope, this person isn't ready. I see it all the time. They could have one, two, three, four, five cups. I don't feel anything. They're just not ready or the medicine is not ready to open up herself. Sometimes people are confused. They, what does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? You're only you, only, only you can find out, you know, I can't, I can't like hold your hand in this. Like you're going to have to do the, do the homework. Yeah, that's reminds me of what the medicine man did to me. He was like, he was pretty much like, you got to figure that one out on your own, which that may be bad, but um, I did figure it out on my own. And I, and I hear what you're saying that it stays with you. I feel like, especially in times of when I'm falling asleep or sometimes I'll even intentionally go back to uh, 
a skate, like a dreamscape that I saw um, when I was with the medicine to uh, soothe me to sleep. It's it's interesting. It, it has stayed with me, and uh, I just think that's beautiful that the the healing it comes. Does. It does stay with you. And this is what people have. They have like a concept. Like, I, I don't like that, you know, a lot of people, average Americans consider this a drug. It's yeah. not a drug. It's a plant spirit that has been used for thousands of years for healing and different ways of healing. It's not, you know, it's not any like, it's not complicated. It's it's very simple. It's two medicines mixed into one. There's a whole story each tribe has a story of where the spirit came from. And it's very simple. You know, this, this is opening up to humanity now because we need it. We need it so bad. We need to be open to connectivity, to humanity, to really like connect with one another. And this is one of the things that will help people break down the walls of thousands you know of years of programming what have they been programming into us and a lot of people say well if you're having plant medicine you know more than this um you're addicted to drugs it's not necessarily true some people can come to a plant medicine ceremony just one time and they get everything they need other people are on a path they they have something they have something with the medicine they have some some contract that they made before they reincarnated into this plane they made a contract with certain spirits peyote and ayahuasca are very big plant spirits they are infinite they are divine beings and a lot of people made certain contracts to work with these medicines for the healing of the planet some people made contracts to be yogis. Some people made contracts to be witches. Some people made contracts to be monks. We don't know why we did it. You can figure it out. Uh, nobody can figure it out for you. You know, when we incarnate onto Earth, there's some some energy, um, our conic energy that makes us blind to who we were, why we're here. We forget thing about ourselves our soul family and you know but we can remember we can remember and with the help of plant spirits it's not the only way their help we can really connect with our own past present and future and guide help guide humanity because that's humanity right now is more than lost more than lost really Everybody has a big role to step into, whether it's with plant medicine or whatever is your calling. But plant medicine is a big part in the shift that is happening. You know, indigenous cultures are a big part in remembering who we were before all this infiltration and programming and blah, 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 blah. We used to be at peace. I, I feel that so much and I see your passion in it. And it, I, it reminds me of my, uh, my calling to, um, to be around indigenous cultures um, started uh, in 2020 when I was reconnecting with myself and the earth and I found plant medicine and it got me interested in indigenous cultures. And I started going to sweat lodges and I think one of the things that attracted me was that it's sitting around that fire um, or around those stones in a sweat lodge. It reminded me of, of the days of the days in the past of my ancestry, of my ancestors sitting around a fire and acknowledging uh, the information of the earth, of all the plants and, and knowing more about that. And I feel like, and as a, as a white person um, and, my my culture has uh, almost already been erased, so I feel that you know, hanging out with it and people who practice indigenous uh, cultures and ceremonies, I remember more um, that earth medicine that my people used to know, um, and I think that we all could benefit from going back to the earth and and uh, participating in these ceremonies as well.
Yes. So, you know, there's many cultures. It's not only indigenous cultures. Many cultures have been erased. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm frozen. Oh, there. Sorry. We can still hear you. You can? Okay. Well, I'm going to keep going then. Okay. So many cultures have been erased. Many cultures have been, you know, extinguished. And um, really, it's our job to reawaken those ancestral memories within ourselves, to share them with, with the beings all around us. Because just like you said, those stones, the fire, they're all reflections of like the divine, um, what is above, you know, like the stars and everything. It's like our job to reawaken them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all, all of our ancestors played with medicine and plants and you know uh two three four hundred years ago and and now only a small number of them do so i i love that uh all of the um the the indigenous uh ceremonies that i've been a part of have been very welcoming and and even the indigenous people have have said listen to this learn these words and share it with other people Yeah, so it's very, very important for for all people, all cultures to come together, sit around the fire with each other, because then we help each other reawaken our own ancestral memories, you know, because your ancestral memories are just as important as my ancestral memories. And we, it's our job to reawaken them now in this time. Um. I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, um, the uh, the legality of these ceremonies. I I know that if that it's that it is legal to uh, to do a peyote ceremony under the Native American Church if you're a chapter of the Native American Church, um, but I'm not sure about the ayahuasca medicine. Do, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's still a bit of a gray area. People have been fighting hard um, for this um, Religious Freedom Act as well. You know, you still might get prosecuted and then it's your job to fight it, you know, and prove that it's your religion. We do. We are incorporated as a church in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. We do have indigenous roots backing and, and people directly from the Amazon that we call our teachers um, but it's still a gray area. It's still a gray area. But, you know, if people want to practice this, they need to get a lawyer, which was what I did. And my lawyer helped make set the terms to where, you know, if anything were to happen, I have the paperwork that I can fight for my status as a church. And, you know, the, the term church is a bit, it's like, a little bit complex to me because generally it has been related to like Christian, Christian, Catholic. And that's a tough one for me. You know, I do believe in Christ consciousness, Christ energy, but uh, a lot of these ancient traditions have been um, extinguished by the Catholic church. So it, it does bring up some like form of like, ancestral trauma like we were just talking about um the term church but out of safety um the term church is the best term that you can yeah. use okay uh, like native you, american church <laughs> for the people watching um do you do you see people of different religious backgrounds coming to your ceremonies all religions all religions i have um jewish muslim Christian, Hindu, you, you don't have to like believe in anything. What we're doing is like, we're trying to reawaken our own spiritual and ancestral memory. We're not, you know, it's not like we're not praying to idols. We're not doing anything that is against any of these religions. So they're all welcome. And do people travel? I'm sure they do travel to go to your ceremonies. Yeah. And if somebody watching is interested, how would they get a hold of you or learn more? 
You can contact me through Instagram. We're still working on a website. So Instagram, mystical underscore juju, or our church page, which is Amazon Roots Family. We are a family. So so we always have our children. Some people like it. Some people don't. But right now we have three small children. And they're always with us. So um, they're always around. Like, you know, if you don't like kids, Probably I'm we're not the medicine family for you. There's other families, but really we consider this a community because all children are all elders are welcome. So if a family wants to come with their children, we'll receive you, you know? So it's like that. Um each medicine family you you can find or connect with, you're gonna connect with the one that's right for you. If people want to connect with me, they could find me for now on Instagram. Um, we will have a website soon, maybe like within the next four or five months, we're, we're still putting it together, but, um, yeah, people can, people fly down all the time. We help with, if people want to like rent, uh, an Airbnb nearby, some people, they want to tent out in our backyard. Okay. I work with each individual. <laughs> That's really cool. Well, thank you for talking with me thank you for sharing about your medicine and um sharing about the healing from the medicine i really appreciate that any final thoughts um well just thank you for having having us really because i'm i'm with her as well <laughs> and um if anything else comes up just you know reach out to me i really liked it had fun I like talking yeah. about this <laughs> mm -hmm. too thank you 